Hello, my name's Sylvester McCoy. I played Doctor Who. <laughs> Number seven. Yes, a long time ago. Anyway, you're listening to Neil. No, you're not. Listen to me. Anyway, you might be soon listening to Neil. Podding. Whatever that is. Neil Before Blog presents... Neil Before Pod. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, my name's Aaron, and I welcome you to Neil Before Pod's podcast out of time. In the wake of there being so many time travel TV shows out there at the moment, some of which have been cancelled and some of which have survived, some both in the case of Timeless, I gathered a few folks together to discuss what a time travel TV show needs to have in order to stand the test. Please note, we drop right into the spoilers for both recent and past time travel shows, should there be any you're not quite caught up on yet. And I will add that this truly is an episode out of time, as we recorded it a couple of months ago or more, before the new autumn TV season started, which means that my comments about Travellers came before I saw any of season two. Enjoy. To discuss this with me today, I have Chris. Hello, Chris. Hello. And I have Craig. Hello, Craig. Evening. Taking a back seat from the old leading the podcast today, Craig. How's it feel? Well, it means I can sit and hurl abuse and then, well, I'll still be doing the editing, so I'll have to edit myself out. That's, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to sit and be quiet. Excellent. I just see you know, hurl abuse. That's just to make me feel good about doing this and I'll just be all nervous. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm looking forward to this right now. <laughs> Time travel's a subject, though, so let's get on to that. Specifically, though, I want to talk about TV shows. There's been a lot of cancelled TV shows in the last couple of years and a few that have survived, and one that gets the notable mention of having been both timeless back in 2018. And for this podcast, I was thinking we could debate through what do you need to have as a time travel TV show in order to survive, or possibly even be good. I have a feeling that a lot of this is going to come down to, well, it depends, based on what else they're doing. But but we'll give it a shot, and I'm specifically going to limit us to TV shows, though. I feel like we're going to have to mention films at some point just to make quick reference to themes of time travel, but otherwise I'm going to focus it down onto, onto the TV shows themselves. I thought I'd throw a quick few other things at you just as well, just to set the scene. Definitely want to cover some of the shows where time travel is like the key theme. Timeless, Travelers, Twelve Monkeys, Making History... Um, obviously, we'll also go into the really famous ones at the moment that use time travel, but more as a plot force rather than really investigating time travel. So, Flash, Legends of Tomorrow, Doctor Who, Lander. Um, but also, if anybody's seen them, want to bring in things like Frequency, an early edition, where it's not about time travel so much as something is traveling through time, in this, that case, uh, information. And if anybody remembers some of the old stuff, feel free to bring in... Do you ma- anybody remember Time Tunnel from back when there was a kid and it would have been repeats from the, from the 60s? Anybody that old? No, unfortunately. No. Disappointing, so I can't bring that up. But Quantum Leap has got to be one of the most famous ones, and that's where my interest in time travel started. Um, any of those shows you would care to admit that you watch, uh, Craig? Uh, the only old show that I can think of uh, that featured time travel now and again was Star Trek. Uh, the various Star Trek series, they all did time travel to one, one degree or another. Uh, I watched a bit of Quantum Leap here and there. Uh, but other than that, um, Doctor Who, old stuff I'm aware of. Other than that, I haven't seen an awful lot. Oh, Seven Days, an American TV show about uh, they travel back in time seven days to prevent something that happened a week ago. Uh, I do remember that. Of course, your favourite that you definitely want to talk about, Flash. <laughs> yeah. We're okay, here. leaving that there, I guess. Chris. <laughs> Chris, um, tell me shows that you liked. Yeah, I mean, the same as Craig, really. Obviously, I've seen odd bits of Star Trek that have involved uh, time travel in the past, a little bit of Quantum Leap, 
uh, Doctor Who. I, I don't know if Flash Forward semi counts as time travel or not when that was on TV, because that was a weird alternate way, but I suppose we can debate that later. Um, yeah, just odd, odd bits and pieces like that, really, that I've seen in other shows that have featured it as a little gimmick in one episode or another. Uh, are you generally a fan of time travel as a plot, or does it uh, not really? Um, occasionally it works well, but a lot of the time it really, really doesn't, and it can wind me up, as people have heard in previous podcasts, where they sort of retcon things through time travel, or they they, uh, they manage to get the rules all mucked up. You know, they, they're meant to be following rules one minute, or the reason they can't do something is because it's in the rules, and then suddenly they, they just change their mind and go, no, actually, they can just get away with doing that now. So it's all right, yeah. Yeah, the plot force, I think, mm. that annoys quite a lot of people out there, especially when you're aiming a show at the world of geekery. That is definitely one of the things I want to bring up in here. I've got four little splits of uh, the agenda, four little things to discuss. Um, rules and consistency would definitely come up there as one of them, but I'll start with a couple of other things. Um, before I do that, though, I'd better give, say the same to Craig. What... Uh, What's your, your top hates and top dislikes about time travel? Does it work for you? I think it's always an interesting idea. I mean, the, the concept of going back in time to look at something that you weren't around for or change something that, that then ripples through to, you know, change something in your, your modern day. That's why Back to the Future is one of my favourite films, but the way, you know, the way that um, changes things for Marty McFly from him going back in time to him returning to his changed timeline. Uh, I think more often than not, it's probably used poorly in, in things that I've seen or just used to a way that's, you know, there's no point in you having time travelled here because you haven't done anything with it. It's just an excuse for them to wear old costumes and run around. Uh, Star Trek particularly did that. But, you know, they would go back in time to the time the show was set because it's cheaper. It's because they can just wear normal clothes and wander around sets that are easy enough to find because it's modern day. Um yeah, I like it as an idea, uh, but I find that it's often used as isn't used as well as it should be. So what I'm getting from this is that both of you are very, I'm going to say, wary of time travel as a theme here. And I think there's definitely more in the side of caution on both of your parts than somebody that really loves to see the time travel. I think for myself, I'll chuck in that I really like the shows that do time travel, but I'd have to agree, it feels like it's so easy to trip up on yourself and the requirements on the writing team are really high unless you're just going to say, screw it, it doesn't matter, there are no rules, and you do sort of a comedy show, in which case it you know, it doesn't really matter then if you get it wrong because that's part of the joke. Yeah. I think yeah. I'll start us off on not the rules, though, I'm going to pick up on something that I wondered if had been changed over the years, which is the the theme of the show, specifically the force behind the time travel itself. Because I wondered, in a lot of the older shows, um, I'm thinking Quantum Leap's the most obvious one, it was God that was, well, that's what we get. I've just spoiled the whole of Quantum Leap. Hey, spoiler alert! <laughs> Um, don't watch Quantum Leap anymore. It's just one of the best shows ever, but I've just ruined it for you. Anyway, there's this other force that's controlling the time travel, whereas it feels like now everything is science that's that's controlling it, as in there has to be a rule. Um, do you think I've seen that and that's true, or am I just making that up? When you say there's a thing that's controlling it, um, so you mean the someone will lay out the kind of we have to go back in time and do this and this is the only way we can do it or is it more the mechanism they use to travel well I think even in some of the old shows the mechanism was always science again just to use quantum leap because it was probably where I started watching time travel they created a machine to do it but they were not in control of it there was something else that they could not identify that was actually choosing the time frames um, one of the other programs that I used to really like, even though it probably won't count as high quality, I guess, uh, and sort the fans of it, early edition, where the information that was travelling through time was delivered by a cat, which is very much <laughs> definitely not science. You know, they didn't build a machine. It's just this guy woke up one morning, a cat 
that turned up and gave him a newspaper and he just had to deal with it. There was no explanation, there was no need to do it, but now do we have to, in order to accept it, need hard science? Uh, I wouldn't say so myself. I mean, even if you look at Timeless, they say we've got a time machine, but they don't say how it works. It just It's a time machine. Uh, Doctor Who has always had the TARDIS. What does it do? It makes them, takes them through time and to different places. That's what it does. Uh, the DeLorean, it just works, although they explain that it has a flux capacitor, but they don't explain how the flux capacitor works. I mean, that's a movie, but still. Um, well, it's technically a TV show. There was an animated TV show, so I'm giving myself that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, the... There's usually the thing that lets them travel through time, but it's very rare that they'll bother to sit down and explain how it works in terms of relative Einsteinian physics or whatever. They'll just, yeah, here's this thing. Once you step through it and press this button, you will travel through time. Yeah, normally it's something along the lines of it's a it's a black hole or some form of gateway or you know it's it's always a, there's a little bit of techno babble that goes in there. But with just enough sort of hand wavium to make it make sense without you asking too many questions of it. In those cases, though, is there not normally a character these days who, if you pushed them, could explain it? Even if it was total technobabble, you assume that they are the scientists, they know everything. It's, it's never that nobody understands what's going on. Yes. Yeah, there, there normally is a mad scientist somewhere in the background, or a team of scientists, you know, controlling the MacGuffin that allows it. Even yeah, in Timeless, you've got the the guy that built it. He's one of the main characters. Uh, Twelve monkeys. You've got the people that send them back in time. They they understand how their device works. Yeah, there's usually someone that knows what's going on. The Doctor, in theory, understands how to work the TARDIS, although he frequently proves that he doesn't. Uh, or she, he or she, now frequently proves that she does. The he or she doesn't. I get. Yeah. I think one of the reasons I was thinking about this, though, was was from there along the lines of what the writers were attempting to focus on when they were creating these shows. Because you've got these scientists who are giving us the ability to time travel, but of course the plot needs some sort of problem to be solved, and the the older shows I remember, specifically the two that I've already mentioned, Quantum Leap and Early Edition, there was very much to steal that line to put right when it once went wrong. That's the reason they went back, is, is to fix things. The past was in some way broken, and the power was saying, right, humans can fix it. And I was thinking, generally speaking, do we have that now? Is, is it the force for good, is that very much an 80s concept that's vanished? And now it's more about the science and messing around with time and, uh, and more individual reasons for going back. Um, yeah, 12 Monkeys, it's about stopping that virus that almost kills humanity. So that's, that's right and wrong. Uh, I haven't watched all of 12 Monkeys, but it's certainly the, the thing in the first season. Uh, timeless, it's stopping, I forget the guy's name now, from changing the past. Um, although they never do. There's always some form of change. Um, so I think it is still there. I think it's, yeah, we must go back and stop, repair whatever damage has been done. Um, and I suppose someone decides that this timeline is the one, the timeline they're leaving from is the one worth preserving. Uh, whether it is or not is another debate, actually. Um, in the case of The Flash, uh, he changes the timeline for selfish reasons. Which is, you know, there, there's nothing good about that, I suppose. Well, I heard condemnation in your voice there, actually, and that, that's the distinct difference, I think, between, you know, when Sam Beckett went back in time, he went back specifically to fix a problem that had already occurred, and it was a selfless act, whereas, yeah, the Flash is a, is a very selfish reason to go back. He wants to have his family whole again. If you, if the, I say it sounded like you were condemning it, is that, you think that's not a good is that not a good concept then to, to build a story around? I think in the case of The Flash, um, I don't think it's a bad idea. I think it was done pretty badly and it was proved that it was proved throughout the run of that season that Barry did more harm than good by doing that. You know, he put a lot of things in motion that, that were problems that needed to be solved that if he'd just done nothing wouldn't have existed. Um, I think it could have been a good idea in this. I mean, again, Marty McFly, he 
he unwittingly fixes his his family. He doesn't mean to. Um, yeah, it, I suppose the selfish attributes it's, they're diff, more difficult to justify because they are about messing with it for your own reasons, and that's normally what the villains are trying to do if there is one. Chris, do you need a bit of moralising in your time travel shows to make it all worthwhile, or can the science of it just be interesting by itself? I think the science of it can be interesting, but you've normally got to have a reason for them doing it, because a lot of the time it is to to fix something that is wrong in the timeline, or to prevent or to protect, um, you know, protect the timeline itself from change, and it kind of gives a bit of a purpose to it. Because otherwise you're thinking, why why would you go back and change it? Why would you go tinkering? Unless you're going sightseeing, in which case it might not be as interesting a TV show. Um, you know, they do need some sort of drive or purpose behind the whole thing for it to really work. Um, you know, and, and like Craig said earlier about Star Trek and the likes, a lot of the time it's used... Or you know, so that they can have slightly cheaper sets for one week, or to use sort of existing points, you know, and and then those ones, it's like it doesn't. It's not particularly that it doesn't work. It's just that it's a bit frivolous. It's unnecessary. I have to say that I feel I'm a bit biased in this myself. I probably do really like the moralising myself. When I you bring up Star Trek, and it made me think of, and Craig will give me the title of the episode for this, the one where a Enterprise from the past comes forward in time, causing the Klingon War to carry on Yesterday's where it should Enterprise. have already stopped. Sorry? Yesterday's Enterprise. Yesterday's Enterprise, yeah. thank you. I really like that episode, and I think one of the reasons that I do remember it is because... Can I spoil it even again? I'm going to spoil all the episodes. Can I, well, they, they, have, they make the choice to sacrifice themselves and go back, and it, it does add that clear, wrong purpose to it. I think it's a, it's a shame that I'm the only one old enough to remember it. And I'm going to say the repeats of Time Tunnel, because I'm not that old, but the repeats of Time Tunnel. As I recall from the Time Tunnel, the two guys go back in time, invariably get captured in some horrible way, and just have to break out before they then time jump again. And I think they do help people, but it's, it's nowhere near the main focus of the, of the show. And I just wonder if there's more room to do something like that where it, it's not moral. I'm, I'm not sure I would like it, but it feels like there should be reasons. Flash's reason, that selfish reason to go back, it feels like that's very human. And that should lead to very human plots. Um, I mean, my issue, my issue with the Flash is that it was terrible. That, that's the problem I had with it. And, right. Yeah, you know, it didn't explore the story in any kind of meaningful way. So I, it left me wondering why they bothered doing it in the first place. Yes. Um, but the the idea itself wasn't terrible. It's interesting that you bring up yesterday's Enterprise, though, because that one it, it has the notable, uh, al- you know, accolade of being a um, alternate universe episode as well. So what you've got is no one, except one character, has a vague notion of what the other timeline was like. Uh, no one knows that sending the Enterprise C back in time to sacrifice itself will um, will fix anything or make anything better. So the, it does have a small debate about which timeline is better. Do, how do we know that that one is? We have no idea. This one could be better. We don't know. Um, so it, it's quite interesting that from the point of view of we have no idea what making this change will actually do. Because you really wouldn't. There's the whole the butterfly effect, you know, the ripples that things events can cause that make people make different choices and things turn out even worse. I'm wondering then if that is what makes this particular theme something that catches your attention and something people have tried to investigate. I so say there's so many shows, even my examples I'd gotten I think I've got twenty examples and even that I've not listed them all, but is it that audience debate is something that these shows are trying to get to. I wonder if time travel actually leads to that more easily than other shows. I think if time travel is your central premise, that's probably what you should be trying to get at, because otherwise, why are you making a show about time travel? I think the shows where time travel is an incidental thing, they might not really be trying to do that, although the better examples in those shows will... um, We'll try and chuck something in. You know, there'll be some little thing that, that makes you think at the end of it. Again, yesterday's Enterprise had the consequence of, um, you know, Tasha Yar's Romulan daughter turning up later on. Uh, that was the unintended consequence, and that made you think about, 
you know, oh right, that, so there there are consequences and impacts that happen as a result of these things. But um, generally speaking, shows that don't employ it as their central premise, it's just a bit of a romp for a little while. Well, seeing as you say that, I know which side of the argument, Craig, you're going to fall on on this, and I know which side I fall on, so I've got to ask Chris, where do you stand on Legends of Tomorrow, given that we've used the word romp? Romp. Um, I think Legends is quite a good romp. If, if you've heard the the um, previous um, podcast where we've talked about Legends, I, th- I think it's actually quite good. It, it, it kind of breaks the mould a little bit for me, and I... It's another one of these ones where the rules can be a little bit flimsy. Um, however, I, I quite like it because it does just seem like an opportunity to go, oh, do we want to meet this historic character? Oh, sure, why not? Let's just drag in that time period or let's go and have a Western and let's go and visit the disco age in a city or whatever. You know, so it, it, it kind of works for me. I, I do like it. So that would give us a show where you you don't need to have any moral considerations or debating point at all there's definitely in there it's just fun and they chuck it out the window i hate that show to be fair i gotta say that i liked i I was okay with series one but season two really blew my a gasket for me but for why that comes up in a different section but i wonder now are there any other shows out there then that have that that or another rather reason for existing other than moralising, other than providing debate. I'm actually struggling to think. Doctor Who is very much an adventure. Um, It's less important about where and when they are most of the time. It's more about what's the Doctor doing in this situation, what's the situation, how is he reacting to it, she. I'm going to have to get used to that pronoun. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm just going to call call them the Doctor from now on. So it's how the Doctor uh, reacts to this various scenarios that he's they're put in. Um, I wouldn't say that they handle their time travel particularly consistency, consistently, although they do sometimes um, make it an interesting time travel story. The Michael Gambon Christmas special being one of them, uh, where the Doctor spent time going through Michael Gambon's life to try and change his personality so that he would let the um, let the trapped ship free from the, the atmosphere or whatever it was, he was doing. Uh, that used time travel quite well. Uh, but most of the time it's just a, this is how we got here kind of thing. It is a sort yeah. of villain of the week kind of thing. Um, and it has the, the the addition of being anywhere in time or space, you know. It is, it is sort of a, a, a gimmick of the format. It allows them to sort of throw it anywhere and set it whenever they want or wherever they want. You know, because it's not just the fact it's time travel, it's the fact it can be anywhere as well. So wherever yeah. you want in the future or the past. Yeah. And every now and again they'll do the historical character or the, you know, explain how something happened, but this is the real, this is the, in brackets, real story of how Shakespeare came up with this play, even though it's not, but um, this is, you know, the explanation for how he got the inspiration for this or whatever. They, so they do that now and again, but it's not the, it's not the point of Doctor Who. I think that's that particular. I want to bring you back to that one because that's one of the headings I've got to to come on to actually about that to sort of changing the past or giving you a new perspective on the past. But yeah. before I go on to that, just this it's for this theme section, do you need any of that explanation then that we talked about where they give you some technobabble? Do you, do you actually like to hear any of that? Somebody trying to talk about tachyon fields and reverse the polarity. Or is that just total nonsense? Um, I like a little bit of Star Trek perspective. Right? Yeah, I, I like a little bit of explanation. I do like that they give you a little insight into how they think it works. Though the majority of the time it is nonsensical. You know, it will be something like Stargate saying if a wormhole goes too close to a black hole, it sort of bends slightly, and somehow you end up back in time. Or you know, it normally is sort of a... If it's one that's occasional, it's like a little excuse to explain how it's happened. Um, if it's the theme of the show, then, you know, you like to know a little bit. And it sort of feeds into what we're going to be talking about later, about rules and consi- uh, consistency. If it's one of these things where they can turn around and go, oh, well, we can't get out at the moment because reason. And this reason somehow affects our ability to do it. Then you're like, well, I kind of now want to know how it works because I don't want you suddenly just pulling this out every, every minute that you don't want it to work, you know? Well, that's the big danger, isn't it? There's just a 
plot force that comes up and stops things happening. And there's a danger, actually. The more you try and explain, the more trouble you could get yourself in when you then have to obey that. But if you don't put anything in, then is there any consequence to it at all? And should we believe the people are in danger just because someone says, no, you can't move that way through this time portal and so on? Star Trek was the one I was thinking of because they always tried to put something in. But it 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 was was it okay? You'll, you'll t- you can tell me this. Did they actually have a scientific advisor that actually made up the words, or did they just make rubbish up at the time? Uh, there was a bit of both. Um, they would norm. They did have a scientific advisor who hung around, and they and they would tell them that okay, if if you want to do this particular thing, then here's the current theory on how you would do that, and it would be up to I guess the production team whether they wanted to go with it or ignore it. Um, because it would be too complicated. I think Technobabble is... I mean, sometimes I just laugh at it on Star Trek because it just sounds like nonsense. And the thing is, even accurate Technobabble sounds like nonsense to people that don't know what they're talking about. So if you try and bog people down with that detail, it probably is a bit alienating for a lot of people. Um, You know, sitting there talking about wormholes and relativistic physics and, and, you know, slingshot effects and, and, you know, all the mechanisms they use to to travel through time uh, in both directions uh, are all well and good. But uh, if if you don't have a working understanding of the theory behind them, then they're just nonsense to you. So I think um, it's good that they might want to do a bit of research ahead of time, but I don't think it's necessary. And it can just bog down the plot by people sitting there explaining stuff to you which, you know, can't be that interesting some of the time. Certain shows go a different way as well. I know you're still an Outlander viewer, and mm. obviously given the setting, it's, it, it uh, is, starts in 1914, and nobody's developing any time travel here at all. And in fact, it does give us a recent example of something that seems more spiritual. I've not seen the total... I've not seen that everything that's out or read the book, so I don't know if it suddenly becomes scientific, but I don't feel like it ever would. In that, the most explanation I saw was you stand in the right place and cast the right spell. Does that change your perspective on it, whether you enjoy it more? Does it make... If somebody's just doing a dance and, and singing a song, is that also a bit dull, or does it not matter because it's flavour for you? The only explanation you're ever given in Outlander is that if certain people touch the stones, they'll travel through time. Uh, it's As far as I've seen, they can do that as many times as they like. But, um, yeah, there's there's no science behind it. And there's no, you know, there's no reason that some people can and some people can't. It's just that some people can and some people can't. Um, just, you know, a pedantic correction. It's the 1940s it starts in um, after the Second World War. So, wrong war yeah <laughs> yeah but um no there's no you know there's no explanation other than some people can do it if they touch the stone which is enough actually because you just know that you know claire can and her husband can't uh, and that's enough and that's enough for me anyway so even if there was some sort of progression in why we were l- l- uh, watching some of these shows from 60s, 80s through to now, it feels like then there's a range of different reasons for the time travel and we're still all accepting of them. Uh, unless anybody would challenge that, is there a, is there a theme, is there a, a particular group of shows whereby I, I don't want it to be God behind this or I, I hate it when it's too scientific? Is, is there anything that really rubs everybody up the wrong way with the, with the force of the time travel? Um, not really. I mean, for me, the the stones in Outlander is pretty much the same thing as the the time machine in um, in Timeless. You know, they they're both vaguely explained things that get them from one place to another or one time to another. Um, they don't really, you know, I think that most shows shy away from over explaining it because there's no real point because the, you know it's either nonsense or it's too scientific for your average viewer and. Um, I don't think I would be excessively put off by anything, although, uh, yeah, over over scientific explanation, it's kind of boring, you know, to to sit through because I'm sitting there wondering is this accurate or not, and I hate doing homework after I've seen a show, 
to figure out if they were being, you know, if they were basing it on anything that's current or not. It is one of those things that they can kind of make up until someone does invent a time machine. They can make up whatever they want. Um, yeah. Having it having it based on sort of slight truths or theories that are around at the moment does make it a little bit interesting. But you know, in the, in the grand scheme of things, it is, I, f- I think it it works really. It's it's one of these you know if if they could explain it properly in a, in a scientific way, we'd actually have a time machine. Seeing as you were the one though to say that you liked a bit of science, a little bit of techno babble to to mm-hmm. to be present in the plot. If you were watching a show, Chris, and the time travel was magic, would that put you off? Uh, no, because if if the show is themed around magic or the fact that a device is, has some magical properties and that kind of explains it. Magic is a a science we don't understand kind of thing, I guess. It's, it's, it's one of those, it's, as long as they don't then try and be scientific then about the magic, if it's magic, then leave it as magic. You know, you touch stones, you go back in time, you, you know, then I think that works, you know. It's, it's don't try and mix the two, otherwise it, it then gets extra confusing. Yeah, fair enough. In which case, I think I'm happy to declare here that reasons for cancelling shows, we're not going to think it's anything to do with the theme of the shows. So I might move on to a particularly sore point for a lot of the geek side of the audience, myself included, historical accuracy, or as I like to refer to it, stop that now, Xena Warrior Princess was not goddess of the universe. And... By that, I mean, I used to despise Xena's history episodes where it turned out that Xena was responsible for every good thing that ever happened on the planet. And also in a time frame that occurred, I think, about plus or minus 300 years either side of when Xena was supposed to have been around. And that's a different form of time travel, but I used to blow my mind. So historical accuracy... Is it important to you, or not at all? Uh, it depends. I mean, that's a really horrible answer. It depends on the show. Um, if the show is shooting for historical accuracy and it's clearly shooting for it, and then it just messes with everything. So, um, you know, Doctor Who inspiring Shakespeare plays is fine because it's just a bit of fun anyway. He's just talking to Shakespeare. It doesn't really change anything. They've already established that the world in Doctor Who is not our own, you know, because there's been so many changes to the present day as well. Um, Timeless, it was all about mucking with history. So their history was accurate until they interfered with it, as I understand it. Um, Because they would often show the cold open where the actual event would take place. And then they would, you know, cut to them interfering with it, you know, as the episode progressed. Um, I don't really need it in my time travel fiction because it is, you know, it is fiction. But I think if they're, yeah, I don't like the main characters are responsible for everything in history stuff. That that's it's well, it's all unrealistic, but it is annoying, annoyingly unrealistic. I think it's when it occurs all the time that bothered me. Like if if Doctor Who inspires one play or a few players or one person even, yeah. then that seems reasonable. But if it turned out that Doctor Who, in any of his or her numerous lifetimes, had pretty much inspired every story on the planet. That would be too far. Um, but you split them there into what sounded like it might be serious or non-serious shows, in which, if you have a serious show, then it feels like they're actually trying to set you in that frame of mind. And to do that, they might have to preserve history, where if you've got something like Legends of Tomorrow then they're not going to have to do that. And I want to bring this up as a bit selfish and we just stumble over this and make it mine, but still, <laughs> Legends of Tomorrow, just to say, first episode of season two, they pretty much do or take several actions that would completely and utterly change the timeline and they are not apologetic about it whatsoever. Yet, even though they talk about having to preserve the timeline and we know there's those funky wraiths that go round, or there might be time cops in the form of the... I've forgotten the name of the people already, the 
Time, time Masters. Time Masters, that's the one. Time Cops, Time Lords, Time Masters. So it feels like that even though they're trying to be less serious with it, they've said that there are all these things going on, and then they totally break it because it makes a good joke. That winds me up something chronic. Now, Chris, you've said that you're a Legends fan, so I'm guessing you're not going to back me up on this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Does that sort of thing bother you? Um, I am with Craig in one way, where if a show sets it up as being uh, protecting the timeline at all costs kind of thing, if the, it, the whole thing is about preventing a villain... Uh, from changing the timeline, from going back and killing Hitler or helping Hitler or changing the outcome of the war or any of these kinds of things, when they are aiming for that kind of accuracy, then I do get peeved when they then start to tread all over everything because it, it, it seems like a waste. With Legends, I think in the first season you're kind of correct because they are trying to prevent someone from doing changes to the timeline and they do make mistakes that would inevitably muck it up completely and even in the second season they do that but it's more about preventing these aberrations from appearing and trying to go and, and solve that um, I don't know, it is, it is one of those because it doesn't take itself seriously then maybe it's almost acceptable There's also but, the fact that you know, there's also the fact that Legends isn't set in our world at all. You know, it's uh, it's a world with superheroes and stuff. And um, the impact of what they've been doing is shown in some of the other shows or, or in the same show here and there. You know, you'll see, like, uh, old historical photographs with them in it or old cave paintings with them in it and and things like that. So there is... Yeah, I suppose that's the case. Yeah. You know, there isn't a metropolis in this... Yeah. In, in the timeline that we're in now. So you've yeah. got to accept that there are some sort of changes in that, whereas other programmes are going for a, this is set in the world that you are in just now, you know, here we'll show you the current president to, as an example, or we'll show you an old newsreel of something, or we'll mention an event that has happened to you. How far can they push that, though, before, even if they've not created a serious show, it starts to undermine what they're doing? And for the example, I go back to that Legends... Uh, say series two episode one where they fly the ship over i don't know if it's actually paris or if it's if it's uh, a royal palace outside of paris but either way at least you know 40 50 people all see the the name of the, the ship i can't name the ship what's the name wave of the ship? rider wave rider at 40 at least 40 people you know see the wave rider and you're thinking right how does history write this off as a colossal uh brain fart of all these number of people why hasn't this been started to be worshipped as a as a, as part of god's plan or or reviled as part of the devil and shouldn't that have wind ranging effects running down through literature right all the way from the renaissance on because it was such a big deal i mean isn't that too far even for a comedy show I suppose in the instance you're talking about, it's essentially a UFO sighting. So UFO sightings have been, you know, documented throughout history um, in various forms. So it could just be another one of them. And I, I don't see that, you know, 50 people seeing something would necessarily change history all that much. Um, I mean, maybe it would, but the considering the time those people lived in, they probably didn't live much longer than an extra couple of years, and they, they probably weren't in contact with that many other people. So. Uh, the impact could have been minimal. Mm. Not to push it too far, then. I'll go one more step, and then I'll leave it alone. But if the person in question on the scene who was most important was the king uh, and the queen, and they would not want to be considered to be in any way wrong, because that's how they were raised, and then they've got the support of a serious number of followers all the way around them, it feels like that wouldn't have been ignored by history, like, I saw this on my own, after I'd been drinking, honest, please believe me, you know, they, they would be much more reliable a source in who they were in that setting. And if that's the case, and they wouldn't have been disbelieved so easily, again, is that not just a bit too far, even for the joke? It's, it's a tough one. Um I suppose that you would have to do kind of some kind of analysis on the kind of person that king or queen was, and what reason they would have to to not talk about it. 
because uh, there could be other pseudo political things going on. Maybe they well, maybe the legends were stopping an event that they wanted to keep a secret anyway. Um, so they just let it slide. Uh, you're not given enough context about what they're there doing. Um, I guess to to go into any kind of deeper analysis, it's just supposed to be they're you know they're having a sword fight in in France in the 1600s or whenever it was, and that was that was as far as it went. And clearly, if it's fun, that's what Legends is all about. So as I'm the one having trouble with that, then I've done the right thing and not watched anymore, you know. So it's definitely yeah. my problem, and that, that's that's reasonable. But I'm just going to chuck it at Chris, same question. Is it not too far for you, though? It is and it isn't. It's something that does rile me a bit, but the fact that they have fun with the rest of it kind of lets me excuse them slightly I know that I'm going to be very flimsy on <laughs> rules that I've allowed and rules that I haven't allowed and shows that I have forgiven and shows that I haven't but yeah it's it's a tough one really, it's the fact that they've kind of had a bit of fun with it but yeah there has been a bit of um, an oversight with some of the stuff that they've done definitely let's swing it completely to the other end then to the more serious sides of a show because it seems like with something like legends you're always going to say that it's fair game to play around with things and change things because it's fun and the show is about being fun so why would you not let that go but if you flip it to the other end where you are trying to be more serious you are actually going back in time to see how it really was back then and the characters are having to interact in a way that must fit in or they're going to be in trouble. How far can you pull it back to change the the plot before it breaks it? So in that case, can you make them responsible for a minor act without breaking it? the plot? Can you change something like George Washington wasn't in Charlottesville, he was in New England somewhere showing my knowledge of American geography to be awful, but you'll have to excuse me on that one. But if that's the case, George Washington is in the wrong place on Wednesday the 13th, 19... Not 19, 1741. <laughs> is that a bad thing at that side of the scale? So, uh, as in, do you mean when they go back... So when they show the time period, they've made, a, they've made some mistake there and... In, in showing it you know so, yeah, it yeah. Is, they've, they've changed something for the pot because it right. would be better if george washington was in a different city because it fits the plot better given the mastermind's evil plan sort of requires it how far can you push that before you break it and the entire audience is going to go no i don't believe that anymore it would come down to the i suppose it would come down to how famous the event was wouldn't it um there there be certain events that people don't really know that much about. Um, if you had the Titanic hit an iceberg in the Indian Ocean instead of the Atlantic Ocean, that would be a bit of a deal breaker for a lot of people because that's just so obviously wrong. Um, also, I don't know if there's icebergs in the Indian Ocean, but it's just an example. You know, that's um, it shows a fundamental lack of any research whatsoever. Um, I've seen a lot of time travel shows where they've went back in time to events that I don't know anything about, so I don't, I don't know if they're right or not, and I'm I still enjoy it. But uh, so I, I suppose if you are a history buff and they do this thing and it's wrong, then it will annoy you. I'm just not a huge history buff. Well, I think if you're putting a show out to the general audience, then anything where it's and she was exactly there on Wednesday the 14th, then it's already too far beyond what you'd expect your audience to know, and that seems like it's it's fair, because why would anybody know that? But I'm wondering with these shows, where you're doing a show explicit about history then, so do the, the history time travel, rather than travelling into the future, you're saying, this show, main theme, historical events... Are you not saying to all of the history students across the planet, come and watch me, this is something you're really going to like? And if you do that, pulling in that extra knowledge, clearly you have to take extra care if you really want that audience. But 
is there a limit beyond which that audience is going to say, I can't accept that? And is there still actually a small range of change that actually it would be even somebody really knew they'd have to accept that because it was okay. Is it, is that, is maybe that's just changing the odd date, um, changing the color of a bit of clothing, or is that sacrosanct? Chris, what do you, what do you need to, to see? Say it's aimed at your level, uh, the history mm-hmm. that you know from school. How much can they change before it breaks your believability? I think they can get away with things like slight clothing changes and everything. I mean, when you hear about, you know, even historical drama, not even time travel shows, when they go back to to period dress or whatever, they're not they're not sitting there with rotten teeth, disgusting looking faces and everything because there was no makeup around at the time. There was no dentistry or anything. They're not, you know, they don't they don't go that gritty way. So as far as costume and things come, then I'm not. I'm not too deep. I think where they, they, they dig themselves a hole is when they start putting lots of little subtext going on, going, oh, well, this is in Boston, or it's in the dockyards in Boston at this particular period. In fact, in fact, we'll give you even more. We'll give you the date and time. We won't even say it's June in this year. We'll say it's June the 12th in this exact year. In fact, we'll then put a clock on saying exactly what time it is. And that kind of gives everyone, all the history buffs, all the ammunition they need to then argue against it because they've went okay you didn't just say a nondescript warehouse you've said it's a warehouse at these docks at this place at this time well i can tell you that wouldn't have been able to happen and it it sort of they they can end up digging themselves where where if they could be slightly vague a bit like we were talking about earlier with the rules of how the the macguffin works that that sends you back in time be a machine or whatever if you leave a bit of flexibility in there then sometimes it can let them off a little bit, but when they start painting themselves into a corner, they just wrap themselves up in knots. Would you... Uh, w- you you're not somebody then who would need to see then the, the, in, the, in a Western horrible teeth uh, because nobody had access to, you know, teeth cleaning uh, equipment at that point. That, that sort of stuff doesn't bother you then? Not, not to the same depth as I know it does some people. Um, yes, I think if a show is going for accuracy in some other areas, then it should then follow along with that. But a lot of them don't really. They they don't aim that deeply because if they did, it, it sort of falls apart, even to the point of accents and words. You know, you will get them visiting ye olde England and, you know, it will be all, you know, old, old, oldy worldy speak. However, the person turns up with a very clipped... Uh, modern British accent or things, you know, Doctor Who is a great example of that where people go back and I've, I think there's a bit of hand waving where the TARDIS translates for you or yes. makes you sound like you're from the place, you know. Yeah. It's that That's kind of like an excuse that they've painted in there. There's other shows where they don't have quite that technology. It's not being translated from them in real time uh, wherever they sit, you know. it's So you've got to go, right, okay, well, for me to understand this and for everyone else to understand this, we've got to accept it. Yeah, otherwise, be... otherwise, it really doesn't work in some ways, you know. There's if you're going this... recent time, it kind of works, but otherwise, yeah. not really. There's also sometimes where the you know the actor playing this historical figure is cl- well, maybe not clearly, but is someone who's say fifty fifty years old when life ex- expectancy and the time period that they're representing is was like thirty five. So the chances are there's an awful lot of like fifty year old people around here, and there wouldn't normally be. And the rotting teeth one's an interesting one. Um, I, I'm I remember Supernatural specifically made that joke when they went back to the Wild West, you know, because Dean had romanticised it in his head and then he saw it and uh, the whiskey tasted like gasoline and uh, everyone had rotting teeth and they were getting made fun of because their clothes were too clean and things like that. So they they used the historical accuracy as a joke in that respect, you know, almost poking fun at the, the representations of history on television. Yeah, they sort of cheated there by having other people go... F- forwards and make the mistakes first get absolutely slated for it and then go ha ha we know how to deal with this and yeah. i think it's absolutely fine because it is a joke and supernatural is definitely not something that you think it's taking itself too seriously <laughs> and we all love the show for that so yeah. that's fine i guess i'm definitely thinking that there are limits as chris has said that have to be obeyed otherwise it's not going to work like if we watched claire go back in outlander to uh 
battlefields of Culloden, and she spent the first eight episodes of the series going, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're saying. That's just noise in that Scottish from that time period. You know, it's, can't understand a word. That would be awful. That would be really boring for someone to watch. Yeah. But if... Uh, there's sorry. also the other direction they can take it. I mean, you've got the, the whole, so this figure was in this place on this specific date. They're famous for it. It was written down, you know, several witnesses corroborated that. And then there's the whole, um, sometimes they'll make that part of the story. It's like, I always read that they were in this place on this date. Why are they not in this place? You know, and then they can do some kind of, um, here's what really happened kind of story, which is uh, not necessarily the we're responsible for all the good stuff in history, but it's kind of a, you know, oh, this is like breaking with expectation. So it's, yeah, it's it's pointing out that things aren't as always reg- as well recorded as you would like them to be, especially the further back you go. I think I like that if they do it with some good purpose and it's it's not too conceited. Um, there's, there are shows where somebody wants to point out... Um, something happened in the past in a way different to what we expected and they do it in such a way as to be so smarmy it's annoying and in other shows they actually just point out a truth that's not generally well known. So I quite liked Timeless for that when they went back to the space launch. I can't remember if it's the, if it's the moon landing or not. It, was the, the, um, it was the first, uh, first American in space. First time in space, yeah. and they give oh, no, it was you Apollo thirteen. Sorry, Apollo thirteen. Yeah, and um, she's been on the news continuously, and I've totally forgotten her name again. And I'm not going to be quick enough to be able to Google her name and talk at the same time. So apologies, I'm going to have to miss it. But there was the name of the the black mathematician woman who was whose contribution to that was completely lost through the bigotry of the day. And it was just bringing to the forefront, did you know this actually occurred? And it's it's sort of real and valuable that it was done. Whereas actually, so in, in Legends, when they said, oh, Einstein was a dunce, his wife actually came up with all the theories. And I know it's supposed to be just fun, but it feels like you're trying to make a, a feminist point about the misogyny of the day using something that didn't necessarily have anything to do with what actually went on in your plotline. Timeless just seemed to do it cleverly, and maybe the show had to be a more serious show to make that point, because I I find it difficult when a comedy show tries to say, and now, children, here's your lesson, whereas Timeless can actually give you some knowledge. Does Does that wind any of you guys up the wrong way, or is that... Do you think that's also a fair game? Uh, the scientist you were talking about was Catherine Johnson. Um, Thank you. Yeah, uh, and interestingly, the reason I got mixed up between Apollo 13 and the first American in space is because the film Hidden Figures is about that event. Um, yes. It's interesting that those that episode and that film came out in the same year. Uh, that uh, probably point. came through the fact that she was just being hailed again at that point yeah. and the writer saw it as inspiration, yeah. but yeah. Uh, I think it's an interesting idea to explore a less well-known historical figure. Eventually, they'll make a biopic-style film about them anyway. But the idea of a time travel show going back in time and and saying, actually, this person is really important, really inspirational to a lot of people, and it resonates because the Rufus character is black as well as as she is. So uh, he can look to her being like, black people can, um, can achieve, they can... Uh, be important and things like that so uh, that was the specific intention there I think to you know to spotlight that to spotlight the the fact that she's inspired a race of people you know who, who weren't um, necessarily historically well regarded up until recently it brings us nicely on to the last point I've got in this little section then which is about the politics of the past if you are going to set your story in the past now in which we know there was a political or social problem, do you have a responsibility to show the bad side of that, be that empire, be that something specific like slavery, or if you're 
dealing with a it's a fun show, can you just ignore that? Are we then in this age so sensitive to the problems of our past that we couldn't even let a good old romp ignore it? It's interesting you would point that out because um, Legends of Tomorrow did deal with slavery in one of the episodes. Uh, Jack's, you know, he, he, there were, he was in a time period where slavery existed and he was put in with all the slaves and it kind of gave him an insight into um, something that he hadn't considered before because it had never been something that he'd been directly made aware of, I suppose. Um, so that was kind of a, a serious moment in an otherwise more fun show. Um, which you know they they get away with. I mean, I think that if if people respond to your characters, then they'll they'll see them in these situations. I think ignoring it is worse. I think if they go back in time to you know a slavery rife era and it's just not mentioned or it's, they've clearly just covered it up or they're not just they're just not addressing it at all. I think that's much worse. I think having acknowledging it, the social issues exist is well. Why why are you travelling back to this time period if you're not going to play around with it? as far as I'm concerned. So in that sense, whereas the the theme and the force of time travel is not upsetting anybody in any way, we're prepared to accept anything from magic through to total technobabble, you're thinking that you cannot avoid dealing with that form of historical accuracy. Uh, well, I think you probably could, but there's no point. Um, otherwise, it's just... You know, it's not worth paying attention to, as far as I'm concerned. Well, here's a here's a for instance, and I have to say, I can't think of a a show that has yet done this. But you might be able to point me to one that has. You could go back in time to any historical point and pursue a. A, a rule of colorblind casting, and you could s- not tackle slavery at all by just mixing in all of your actors. And sometimes you see this on some of Channel Four shows and so on. They they they, they just pursue a complete colorblind cast, and they say we are not dealing with race relations in this show. We've got another topic we want to discuss, and and so we're we're just going to ignore. Not ignore it, but we're we're taking it off the agenda. Could a time travel show do that, or would it be ridiculed or slated for trying it? I don't think they'd get away with it personally. Um, I suppose it depends. You know, if you're going back in time to a city when slavery was rife, then you might get away with it. But if you're, you know, if you're setting the story on a plantation, uh, no, you. It would just be it would be seen as insensitive, I think, more than anything else. I wonder if there are limits though that are being pushed because I'm desperately trying to think of it, so I'm gonna go with Stargate. They frequently went back to Egyptian times, or they went to a planet where Egyptian times were still um that were still in uh, in use because the time period hadn't moved on. And they did have slave peoples. Now, they never gave the slave peoples a good time of it. I'm not saying that they ever did that, but they never really pointed out how horrific it would have been. You know, the the slaves always look reasonably healthy to the extent that uh, if one of the bad guy aliens took a fancy to a woman, you know, the, the, he would just he, he wouldn't be put off by the fact that she'd just been through back-breaking work and couldn't have possibly put on all that makeup that clearly the the prop guy had just put out. So they th- maybe in that case they've th- if it's not connected to our current sensitivities because we can't see the fact that oh we enslaved African populations we didn't enslave this mysteriously light skinned Egyptian slave race that we can't even properly place then it it doesn't hit us so hard. Can can we get away with it then? Was your example specifically an alien planet, though? Or was this a time travel episode of Stargate? Um, that's a good question. I'm thinking entirely in the theory here, so I guess I'm taking one as equivalent to the other in this case. Yeah. Well, ancient Egypt's a, a strange one, isn't it? Because the, um, the 
in some cases, slaves weren't horribly mistreated to the extent that we might think they'd be horribly mistreated. You know, they were obviously essentially prisoners who were made to do work, but there would be some of their living conditions were okay, depending on what level they were or whatever in this slave hierarchy that had been built. Um, well, I think that's dangerous to yeah, take as a sweeping one. statement, actually, because imagine that you were a slave and you were given a quality position because you were trusted and you were essentially given the position of the butler. You were still an enforced butler. and You could mm. make any choices and you can still be executed at a moment's notice just because the ruler decides they're having a bad day. And that must hang over your head and it must cause you some significant mental issues to deal with. Something that never really would come up. But, you know, is that too much for Stargate? Um, I mean, Chris, would you have said that Stargate was a waste of time if it had tried to go into too much details about a slave race and how horrific it would have been to be them? I think they tried to touch on it a bit, but like you say, they didn't really do it in the graphic sense. They would do it in the talking and having people tied up or, or you know, showing people being whipped, but because of the time slot and the kind of programme it was, it could never go fully into the horror of it, really. Uh, not in a way you could if it was on a you know a, a cable network or on a, a, a pay to view kind of thing, or in a film you know a, a high rated film. You know it's it, it's one of those ones that again because of the media and what what you're broadcasting on at the time you couldn't get away with it as such. I mean a, a lot of the theme of the show was them trying to liberate. Um, the slaves from the, the gold and, and get them away from all that. That was sort of a heavy bit of what Stargate did. You know, they kind of led the rebellion a little bit um, to try and get rid of it. But yeah, they didn't show the full brutality of it. I don't think. So they did put it in. Then I think is is they, what they, we agree they on. Didn't have yeah. it there. Yeah, it's it's one of these things. I mean, it's very difficult when we're discussing this because there's there's bits that you're like, oh, okay, it, it seems that we're coming up with exceptions to the rule each time, and that there is a bit of a bit of flexibility in there. Each show is probably going to take its own liberties and go as far as it can. As you say, the in the, the time slot for Stargate means that it, it has to do a certain set of things and the audience of Legends of Tomorrow will require certain other things. And if you get some really hard science fiction, then it will probably try and go into something much more gritty. So so I think I, I definitely get that. So what about a show like Outlander again? Just to try and bring up something that's political, but possibly not anywhere as awful how about Outlander and it's English versus Scottish politics there's a, a bit of that going on here at the moment with the threats of more independence votes can you bring something like that in and have a bit of fun with it because it's not quite so serious or do you suffer exactly the same problems here if something bad was presented about Scotland, it would be seen as terrible to the viewer because Scotland is being picked on by the brutal England all the time. Outlander handles it with with enough complexity, I think. I mean, you are on the side of the Scottish because that's who most of the main characters are. But a lot of the English soldiers that you see have, um, you know, they're, they're developed enough to make them not just seem like the moronic villain that they have to defeat. So the, the conflict is is complex enough, although it is heavily weighted on the side of the Scots, which is comes from the source material that you know that would have been from the book. I would imagine I haven't read it, but um, but the idea is that you know Culloden is coming. This is a historical battle that happened. It's now happened as as the show is half you know where it is now. Uh, but it's you know it's set in it's an alternate history in the sense of there are characters that never existed participating in this in this battle and there's someone there that's travelled through time but the, the historical events are still happening the time period's very important because of the tensions that were existing at that point so they're having a bit of fun with it in the sense of letting the characters that have been created for the, the book and the show play around in that sandbox but uh, it's not the 
yeah, English people are evil thing. It's more like the at this point in time, the English and Scots were at odds with each other, and it led to a bloody conflict. I think you might be. I think you're, Chris doesn't watch Outlander, so I might throw. I something don't slightly. watch Outlander, so I'm, I'm very sorry that I can't. I can't contribute to that. I'm going to chuck a different one at you then, along the same sort of lines. But I think you're a Doctor Who fan. Mm-hmm. I think Doctor Who does raise social issues of the day. And, again, I'm prepared to believe that they are serious, but they're not probably quite as serious as the enslavement of an entire race out of a whole continent. Do you find Doctor Who handles its its socio-political stuff well? Is it welcome? I think it does does i think it treads a very fine line i mean it's on the bbc so the bbc are always very i mean the team of attack lawyers that must go along to doctor who and try and make sure that anything it covers it doesn't yes. uh, do danger i'm sit sure on the fence always sit on the fence we can't yes. take sides on the bbc yeah the bbc <laughs> is like yeah well there were always good and bad people on both sides and uh, <laughs> but yeah doctor who i think I think it does manage to do that, but a lot of the time it will shy away from the nitty gritty. Again, it's you know I know people hate when uh, when this gets said, but Doctor Who is a kids' TV program, so it's <laughs> uh, it's one of those ones that how dare you yeah, how dare you say totally that? Yes, yeah, it's, it's totally not. It's for grown ups only, um, but it's um, <laughs> grown ups and childish adults. Uh, <laughs> so it's yeah, it 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 does try it is limited again like i was saying about stargate and other tv shows it is limited by its intended audience i think and what it can do you're a doctor who fan as well craig you must have a a feeling on the subject i think for the most part doctor who doesn't bother with historical accuracy anyway uh on occasion it does but the the whole so the whole idea of what they'll do is they'll go back in time to i don't know uh, a period in time where um the class system was much more defined than it is now, so that the lower classes were suffering to the point of starvation and dying of disease and things like that. And uh, there was an episode in the most recent season where the Doctor gave an impassioned speech on um, how you're only, you know, you are judged by the treatment of your uh, the lesser in society. So the way you treat this kid who's starving and doesn't own his own shoes, uh, that reflects upon you. And um, so they do attempt that bit of social commentary in that regard, in the sense of, no, you you don't get to just ignore the problem, because that makes you the problem. Um, they try and frame it in that way, usually. It's more, but the, the interesting thing about the Doctor is he's an alien observing humans, uh, so he gets to make these comments on humanity without, you know, being a part of it. Uh, so that's the outsider looking in uh, angle, I guess. Um, You've both mentioned... The possibility that children might be watching Doctor Who then, so whoever it was actually, the program's actually aimed at. I wonder then if that's one of the last points worth touching on in this particular section. If a show is going to be watched by children who are going to be learning history, does a show then have a greater responsibility to show it how it really was? in the way that adults are not going to be interested in, they've already moved past that. Mm, the context for kids is an interesting one. Um, kids may go into school the day after watching an event take place in Doctor Who and and get, you know put their hand up and say to their teacher, oh, this happened next. And it's like, no, it didn't. Uh, so, you know, this TV show you watch was lying to you. But I suppose... Yeah, on impressionable viewers like children would ne- would be that might be a bit of an issue for a while, but it, get, it does get to the point where you move past it, I suppose. And I, I must have watched a lot of time travel stuff when I was younger that was inaccurate, and it's you know I've gotten to the point where I can accept that it's going to be inaccurate sometimes for the sake of drama and fiction. But I don't recall how I reacted to it at the time when I found out it didn't really happen like that. If it triggers an interest in something then I suppose it can only be a good thing because then they might research. And I always forget that kids now have the power of Google at their fingertips <laughs> that, you know, I never did. It was, you know, if you want to find out about that, there's an encyclopedia upstairs, off you go. Um, 
you know, ask ask your teacher, go to the library, you know. But now you can you can Google something and find out. And I, I think for a lot younger children, they might not be aware of what they're seeing. And in the case of sort of showing, I don't know, slavery, they'd probably be more worried about the protagonist that they've seen every week in the TV show over the plight of a, a, a slave on a TV show. Which is, you know... <sighs> Which is one of those things, you know. So, so how do you how do you touch on that, or how do you convey, you know, the empathy and and the situation? I don't know. I think there's no what? doubt that if you've got sort of a six year old, eight year old boy, and you show them combat, you can be guaranteed that as soon as the show or film ends, they will be outside picking up whatever weapon they can find, definitely <laughs> pretending to be the most evil person that was mm. in that show because it was so cool. And that's that's just the way human beings are going to be. But what if you go to sort of young teens then? Or you come into sort of 10 and 11 and they're starting to be a bit more sensitive to the way the world's going on. Say, I'm, right, I'm going to give you a scenario, Chris. You are now a parent. You've mm-hmm. got three kids. Oh, Christ. Somehow you've not gone mad. <laughs> And you're okay with it. And generally speaking, you've got enough sanity to stand watching an hour's TV show with them without anybody kicking off, they'd be screaming, or food all over the walls. In that TV show, they present something that is known to everybody because you're you're definitely taught it, but maybe they've just not encountered it in their school yet. And for the sake of having an argument... Uh, giving a topic on, I'll say, Guy Fawkes. Everybody knows about Guy Fawkes blowing up the Houses of Parliament. Now, in this TV show, just for fun, they changed the plot because it would actually suit their plot needs better that Guy Fawkes was actually blowing up um, York Minster. Do you have a problem with that if your kids go afterwards talking about, oh, yeah, Guy Fawkes blowing up York Minster? Or is it okay because if they look at it later, they'll find out the truth? Oh, well, that was a good setup. Uh, I probably wouldn't like them changing that, I suppose, unless they make it that it's not the events of, bon- you know, of, of that set up bonfire night, if you know what I mean. Yeah. If they talk about it, if they do it like this is his first attempt ever at doing something. It doesn't work, but then he goes on to to Parliament to try Parliament next. So this isn't the thing that makes him... Then I suppose I'd be all right with it. I'd have an issue if they were saying that was the reason that Bonfire Night happened. So if it adds to it, that's fine, but I can if imagine... It adds, that they- if it adds a bit, then fine, but to twist it entirely, then no, because that is the kind of fact that a kid would remember and try and repeat us well not try and repeat but you know what i mean if, if a teacher then asks oh, does anyone know about guy fox and they go yeah i saw it on the film and it was this then so, you know, oh sorry karen sorry no no it's all right i, I was waffling <laughs> i was gonna say let's take that up a level then say then now they give you a different tv show that follows and you've still got enough sanity to watch another hour's tv show <laughs> so you're still fine <laughs> And it's this time more far fetched by the second. No, yeah. well, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, no, not, not only have I got someone to sleep with me once, but I've got them to sleep with me three times. That's that, that's <laughs> taking it a uh, thing. I've definitely invented the time machine by then. Right? Okay, carry on. Or three people once. <laughs> three people once. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. Scene set. You've now got your full history laid out with as many partners as you need to make this believable. And in this scenario, the second hour is showing you a TV series about Cromwell. Well-known figure. Everybody discusses Cromwell at some point in in British history. I'm going to assume that. I've never been educated in Scotland, so actually that could be nonsense. But let's hope for the best and carry on. Um, Insert other famous character here as needed. And now they show you that Cromwell has different personality traits than you was told at school. He argues with different characters. He is in some way during different events at different cities than previously was. Have I now crossed the line where it's acceptable because they're just tweaking it a bit rather than just saying he didn't kill King Charles. Actually, he killed his son. We just didn't know. You know, it's not that serious. It's just small other changes. Are you now okay with it? Because it's still wrong if they look it up on Google and they've got their phones out and they're going, Dad, is this all right? Where, where, where's, where's your line? 
um, as the parent watching, I suppose, then, if you're being queried on it, then you would correct them and go for it. But, yeah, I, I, still, when you put it like that, I, I do think there's a bit of inaccuracy in there, and that would uh, inform wrong facts. But I'm sure that's probably happened to me in the past, to be honest, thinking about it. Programs like, I don't know, Horrible Histories or stuff, which do go along the lines of being accurate to a point um, but yeah, I don't know. I really don't know with that one. And that I'm, on, I'm on the edge with my three kids. You know, it's a bit, it's a bit tough already. It was too much to put on one person, so I'll change it slightly. Then I'll put it to Craig, and I'll, I'll lessen the, the pain of it slightly. Yeah, they, they're they're yours one. now, Craig. I'm off. <laughs> oh, you have do- you have adopted one child only. <laughs> And oh, for God's no. sake, Craig, could you not have taken more? <laughs> that's, that's all he could do. Yeah. That's all he could deal with. It's somebody from a totally different culture than yours. If you want, it's an alien, uh, a young time lord even, maybe. Whatever you like, whatever this adopted person is from a totally different culture. And they're now watching your TV shows. Translation to normal everyday stuff. I'm watching an American TV show. Or a French person is watching uh, a British TV show, to ground it slightly, does then the historical accuracy become different? Maybe if it's a, a kid from that society learning something wrong about another culture. It depends on the scale of it, I suppose, and it depends what the, the show is trying to get at, because time travel, if, if it is a time travel show, since we're talking about time travel, it's not like a historical drama, so what's happening here is that the very premise is changing that event in some way. So if their presence is changing that event in that way, it's okay. Uh, if they're just going around and saying, you know, if on their way in, one of the characters says, right, this is what this guy did, and it was really important that he, he continues to do this, and the facts are given as wrong, then it's that thing I keep going on about with kids' TV shows that I do watch. The You know, the ones that don't talk down to their audience. I hate it when shows talk down to their audience because they assume... This is only for 10-year-olds, and 10-year-olds are dumb, so we don't have to even try. We don't even have to look this stuff up. We'll just, you know, we'll just put it down and, and no one will care. Um, that That's more it comes down to kind of bad writing and not valuing the audience rather than anything else. But, yeah, it depends what the show's trying to do. Is it trying to alter this historically accurate point, or is the actual interference of the characters altering that? event in this way so i think as a link between both the two topics we've discussed the theme and the historical accuracy we've we've kind of decided that both of them i think that there are as long as the writer's set is setting out their premise well enough and they stick to it right from the start so everybody knows what they're getting it's 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 more acceptable but it's it's when the show goes against what it is self set up that we have a problem, which of course brings us nicely to rules and consistency, or as I like to put it, could Marty McFly take the Terminator? And for this particular section, which could be the most contentious, I'm wondering how much can I assume the existing setup of of time travel rules and paradoxes we know. Chris, are you comfortable with your paradoxes? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> Craig, how, how, how are you on closed causal loops versus consistency paradoxes? Yep, I'm fine. Uh, I've seen an awful lot of it. I've seen Terminator and Back to the Future a million times each. So, yeah. So, so for, for the audience, actually, just in case, I'm going to use the excellent reduction that was used in Flash. <laughs> I forget which episode, by Sis- but Cisco told... Cisco was explaining it to... Who was explaining it to, Craig? To Joe. Joe, he's explaining it to Joe. The, the two different variations, basic variations on time travel, which he said terminate, as you say, close causal loops. And they are something set up whereby the cause and effect run in a repeating cycle, potentially to the fact that you might not even be able to change anything, or possibly 
you can change something, but the universe conspires to bring it back to the way it was. So that's your Terminator setup. And then the other one we've got is your consistency paradoxes, which is the sort of thing you're occur- having occurring in Back to the Future, whereby you can clearly change time. It's the other problem, but there are consequences to you changing time. Either you simply can't do it, and the, the universe stops you in some way, or you can do it, but that requires you to have some explanation of it. Perhaps you've got like Back to the Future and Continuum, you've got different universes that get created. And then you've got sub-variations on those whereby if a new universe is created, a new timeline is created, what happens to the old one? Do you have something really grim, like in Continuum, where it falls apart? The old timeline actually physically falls apart around all the characters? Or is it like Back to the Future, where it's pretty serious and it's vanishing from the ground up, but it's handled in a more comic manner? Either way, you've got time potentially catching up somehow. So we've got, yeah, Terminator's the one side of it, closed loops. And you've got Back to the Future's the other side, where you just need to have a way of explaining what's going on. And I think the opening question I put to you, might start with Craig this time, do you find one or the other more enjoyable inherently to watch or no distinction? Actually, I mean, I find myself thinking, or maybe it's the best examples I've seen are the kind of closed loop ones. And using Terminator as the example, I mean, I know we're supposed to be more talking about TV shows, but also Terminator TV show, so fine. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, um, although I don't know what the rules were on the Terminator TV show, come to think of it, but never mind. Uh, basically, basically, the the end of the first Terminator film, um, you know, you see that photograph that Kyle Reese had with him be taken, and up until that point, it hadn't really occurred to me that um, certainly the first time I saw it, it hadn't really occurred to me that oh yeah, that's what's happening here. We're getting to you know the. All it was is stopping Sarah Connor from being killed because John Connor would be important, but it never entered my mind that this is how John Connor would come to exist. So it's a bit of a punch in the gut at the end of the film when it reveals that. So that was a, a nice handling of that. Um, I've seen other things where the realization that they can't actually change it and they're just they were always part of it is seen as the twist as well, uh, which is you know it, it tends to if they handle it right, it tends to be quite interesting. Although. The reveal at the end of Back to the Future where Marty's like, what's this? This car is mine. My family are not losers. My mum's not an alcoholic. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, It's treated as a kind of, oh, look, uh, the mess you made is actually fine. You know, you did it better. It all turned up rosy for you. Yeah. Yeah. Even though he doesn't remember these people that he, you know, are now his family. Even though they look the same, they're not actually his family. But that's an issue they don't deal with. Well, as you, as you say, this, that's the films. Bringing to the TV shows, then, you've got, as you say, you've got the Sarah Connor Chronicles, which is set in that same background, which presumably still has to deal with the same problem of the future is coming and you can't change it. Um, there's 12 Monkeys was a debatable one when it was being produced, I think, because the film has that darker side of nope, this is happening, you're all going to die. But the, the TV series is, 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 even in its opening hours, immediately switched to, no, nah, you can change things, and here's the proof actually on camera when when they show that lighting effect and uh, uh, the proof that something is changing. Mm. And either way, both of them, in their starting out point, they were darker. As you say, it's a kick in the gut when you learn this. Is is that more interesting to you then? Because it's it, it it's it is darker. It, it is a bit more grim. That the brutality to it does allow you to enjoy it more. When it's done well, I think. I mean, sometimes the you, know, you see the twist coming a mile off, and uh, and the character should have seen it come a mile off, but the, they don't. And that's a, that's more annoying than um, than anything else. So you know, you know that the the events there, the the events they're taking part in are destined to end up this way and they're just too stupid to realise it for what you know, for plot reasons or the characters an idiot reasons. Um that that's kind of annoying when it's like, Oh my god, I never realised this but um I generally find it yeah, I find it better when it's a it's a surprise like that. Or sometimes they might explain that uh, you know, this will change the past 
Um, or this won't change the past. You can't change the past and then they end up doing it. Um, that that can that can be a nice little surprise as well. Well, Chris, let me give you the other side of it then. Flash, which is is definitely been shown that you can change the past, and it does have consequences. This. Is, it, does this have the same problem, that it's only good if it's done well, or is this easier to do? Like Back to the Future would suggest that it's a bit more fun, there's a bit more room to manoeuvre, so we don't care as much. How, how easy or hard is it for this, for that side of the... It's one that where, where you make your main villain a time traveller in a way, and then you undo what creates a villain in the first place. How does a villain exist to begin with kind of loop? And the the you know Flash got itself tied up in this last season in that kind of of loop where the, despite the fact that they're able to prevent causes, it's still the effect and everything is still there, and that can be a bit of a problem when you make it your core thing for an entire season. Then it can have an issue. I think if you're doing it in a short sharp burst it's less painful you know you sort of uh, um, you know rip the tape off a bit a bit quicker and then it kind of works it's less raw um, it's, but if you can just say ah but this is now in a new timeline it's, it's it doesn't matter what happened before the energy has moved into a new line, timeline it doesn't matter what's happened in the old timeline is that not just a cure-all that just makes it all better um I don't know, I'm trying to think of the, the right way of describing it, but... In that scenario, a paradox doesn't exist, because what you've got is you've got a person that wasn't there before interfering with stuff, and the entire new universe is shaped around them. So, that, that well, that's the, the current Star Trek movie thinking, you know, as in, if we just... If we just go back to a point and uh, we change everything from then on, then we don't have to stick it rigidly to canon. Um, that solves that problem. Um, it also solves the problem of what do we do with this guy who's from the future? Is he supposed to get erased or does he stay since it's technically he's just moved universes and to an earlier point in time, then they're fine. They don't, you know, nothing happens to them. But in that case... Is it the cure rule? Because it's not created that same level of paradox. It seems that it's a, a Europe. Do you find them enjoyable to watch? Is that all, is that okay? I think it's fine. Although the thing is, the the issue I have with that all the time is, why do I care about this new universe? Why do I care about this time travel story? What is it? It isn't impacting the timeline that it came from. So there's almost no stakes in that respect. It's also when you you get used to characters and then there's no there's no threat because it's oh that character's dead oh god I like that character that was my favourite character oh it's all right they've just gone back in time and they're back alive now oh that's fine or to the point where oh I really like that character and the way they are oh they're quite fun and oh yeah yeah they're they're quite a cool character oh no they've gone back in time and they've changed it and now the character's a complete dick it's it's one of those that you're like okay, so the writers got bored of having the character that way, the actor got bored of having the character that way, they've decided that for reasons they're just going to redo it, and it kind of it destroys a bit of investment that you've done in the show to a point, especially if it's a show that hasn't been time travel based all the way up to that point. I think it's understandable in, I don't know, like a continuum, because it's always been a time travel show. It's always involved time travel elements and people manipulating time to change the future kind of thing. So it, it works, whereas in something like The Flash, it's happening as a couple of episodes thing, and then it, it impacts the whole the whole story from that point on. So it's like you're not really expecting it, you are investing your time in characters and the way they behave, and then it's erased and taken from you. It feels like that's a problem that can only occur, though, with the consideration of paradoxes. Like, if you have Sarah Connor Chronicles, and I think, just to be annoying, the last ever episode of season two, they do start talking about different universes, just to, different timelines, just to kind of break it. But if you if you stick to the earlier points in for the first season, where it is more about closed causal loops, they can't do that to you. 
You know, they can't just go back and change a character because this is a closed loop. Everything that's gone before and everything that's going to happen is linked. So you're safer in those. Is that then something where you think, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm happier there? Have you ever enjoyed a consistency paradox one, conversely, where they've done it and you found, oh, it's much better that they could change the past? I'm struggling to think of a specific example. Uh, yeah, weirdly, in comic books, they've sometimes used time travel to change the future or change the present to the point where a character, a beloved character who was dead, comes back. And people tend to be okay with that because the character that was dead is now back through a result of temporal shenanigans. Um, in terms of making a show better after they've made changes, I can't really think of any examples of, of any time it's gotten better, although Timeless was its central premise. Every time they returned to the present, it was a different present. Uh, you know, where, I don't know, a James Bond film had been made about their adventure, uh, or whatever. Uh, and I suppose, well, it wasn't making the show better or or worse, it was just that's what the show was. It was all about the interfering with the time, you know, interfering through time travel. Let's change it slightly then. Is it good as long as you can work it out? Like if, if you can say, ah, oh, this happened, which means this happened, and you, you've got a sense of it, or are you okay with it being completely inexplicable because some intelligent scientist comes along and says, ah, oh, well, this is this problem, and therefore blah, 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 blah. And you think, well, that's just nonsense. Do, do you need to be able to work it out or to, to, be, to enjoy it? It can be good fun to endlessly debate, you know, about, oh, what if I, this thing, uh, does that create this thing? And then did that lead to this thing? Uh, there, there's some fun in that. I think um, in those instances, it doesn't break the show, though. You know, it, it does give you clues about how it might have worked. And, that, and and that's always good fun to just sit and have a chat about a few over a few beers. Um, also, the, you can clearly see what event led to what event, you know, Event A led to event B, which then caused event C. Um, that that can be quite fun as well. I think Chris has expressed a problem with the, the main the main villain not being able to have been born. So, you, Chris, you're saying with that one that you that that dis- destroyed your enjoyment of the show because you thought I, without a knowledge of quantum physics, I've now got reason to challenge this. Is is that the end of that time travel show for you? Because it's it's too difficult. Um, it, it's more the fact that if I'm smart enough to figure it out, it means I've been really really dumb. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's it, rather than it, it, it doesn't destroy it, but it kind of makes you think. Well, if if that's if that's the rule, if the rule is that something that you do right now is impacting the future, and when it impacts, it impacts instantly. Then when this solution happens everything that you have done to that point now doesn't exist and you're now back to the start again where none of that happened oh that's Surely. the waking up from a dream situation that everybody hates well, all, almost and it, it, i i get exactly what you're saying is it's almost just as bad to to retroactively delete everything that's happened and go back to the opening episode where they walk through the door and go and what's going on today oh there was some lightning in the middle of town but not much happened <laughs> and then carry on as if none of it existed in the first place but you know it's it's one of those you know i i'm I'm not i'm not too sure but if i if i can figure out a way to unravel it then i know they've not done a great job the flash yesterday's oh sorry carry on uh, the flash example is a is an interesting one because what you had in season one was when eddie killed himself it therefore prevented the villain's existence and the universe immediately reacted by opening a wormhole that was tearing it apart you know, this universe can't exist, it's now going to be destroyed. And obviously through um, through running very fast, as, as Barry always does, that's how he solves his problems, he ran very fast. Uh, so he ran fast enough to stop the, the, the wormhole from doing that, so therefore allowed the, the timeline to preserve itself and continue on, despite this paradox. I was okay with that, that was absolutely fine. You know, that's okay, the, the paradox did exist and it's been dealt with. Uh, when you get to season three, yeah, it's like Savitar can now no longer exist. 
it's just gonna we're just gonna have to wait half an hour until time catches up with them and erases them. But there's no sense of uh, we're gonna have to close another wormhole, you know, to to keep our timeline alive. There's no sense of that at all. So um, so there's not that there's a rules problem and that you could work out or not work out. It's the fact that there was an inconsistency between the rules of one season and the rules of another yeah. that was bothering you. Yeah, and the writers don't care, so why the hell should I? That, that's essentially the, the way I was thinking. Absolutely. That I, yeah. That's something where they just... It's like the dream thing. It's because it says you can't trust that any of this means anything because they're just going to undermine it. I think yeah. an example I'd like to bring up of where I think they've reset it to what it was, but it's actually still really good there, is that yesterday's Enterprise episode. At the end of the episode, um, someone in uh, the helm says, uh, oh, sorry, Captain, I, I thought I saw this blink on the scanner, but actually it turned out to be nothing. And Captain Picard goes, all right, okay, carry on. You know, nothing happened. Yeah. But actually, when you, the viewer, consider it, it's awful because this sacrifice that this group of people made is even more poignant because we know that it wasn't just an accident that they turned up and it wasn't just in, in the spirit of an emotional moment that they chose to sacrifice themselves. It was actually after a long deliberated uh, time and I think they even chose all to do it to go back in time and you think oh but n- nobody knows that's going on so you've got a complete reset which is actually all the more horrific because of it which I think is absolutely amazing and then there was the gut punch co- uh, consequence later on when it was revealed that uh, Tasha Yar or the alternate Tasha Yar had a Romulan daughter uh, That so that, that comes up later that was a consequence that wasn't considered and again when it's brought up to Picard he's like I have no idea that this event happened. And, you know, he hears about it, but then, yeah, he had nothing to do with it. It was just, it never happened. Uh, but it did have consequences. So it's quite interesting that the, the memories of the characters are erased, but it still does have that consequence. In which case, there is a consistency that the writers have actively written in because they've said this action has a consequence and we're not going to ignore it. I'm trying yeah, to remember, I think there was a, a Star Trek Voyager episode as well that involved them destroying the ship, but just blowing themselves up, and then it, it closed the loop, and then it reset back again at the end of the episode. It might have been that like was a two, e- two year episodes of hell. long. Year ah, of that's hell. the one, yeah. yeah, that's it. Janeway collides Voyager with the, the time ship thing that's buggering up time all over the place, uh, and once she does that, it just resets it to the beginning, before yeah. the, the time ship was ever built. Which sounds like it's more of well, we needn't have bothered watching this last 42 minutes of an episode because nothing actually happened. It was, that feels yeah, like it's well, the it was actually 84 was, minutes, but yeah, yeah, it was, it was two pointless. Minutes, was it? <laughs> yeah, the, the um, last five minutes of the episode happened and nothing else. <laughs> yeah. So it, it seems like it's reasonable then that we, we definitely want consistency, but we're not too worried by the rules in terms of what they are as long as they stick to them. What about some of the things that you've already mentioned in passing then i think chris was the one that said about you change something in the past but the characters or the plots in the present so there needs to be some catch-up do you want the present to change instantaneously around the people in the present or are you not bothered if there's a bit of time taken for the ripple effect come through time How, how do you view that it depends on the show and how they've done stuff in the past. If they've previously written it where as soon as something happens, the effect happens instantaneously, then um, then they've got to follow that. However, in other shows, I have seen you know the two worlds colliding or smashing together or one slowly being erased and sort of closing in on itself. I, th- I think it all depends on the show and what they what they set out with in the first place. What the what the rule was, you know. I I, I don't mind the sort of cataclysmic ending if that's what they intended in the first place you know if, if that's it but you know you've got shows where they put people in sort of time life rafts for want of a better word so that they they can sort of survive the the paradox of the you know the world's colliding craig is that the same view as long as it's consistent with the show you're not really bothered which way they go with it 
Yeah, um, consistency is, is all I really ask for. I think because um, we don't know, you know, we don't know if we changed an event in the past if it would immediately ripple through or not. Um, it's it's diff- it's a difficult one because I mean I've seen so many shows that just don't do it consistently. It, it's really weird um, that, that I think about this one specifically. But there was an episode of Roswell, which is a show I used to watch, uh, where time travel happened. And the idea was that the older Max was trying to erase, stop an event from happening that, that ended up proving really bad for him. And when he when he did and it was stopped, he was talking about, well, I'm going to be erased soon. And it was an emotional thing. Uh, you know, it was an emotional hook so that he could say goodbye to the, the character, you know, that he was interacting with and things like that. And it worked on an emotional level. And I think that was the only time Roswell ever did time travel, though. So it's unclear if it was consistent. So I suppose, like... Yeah, if it's, if a TV show does time travel once and that's how it works, then it's fine. I wonder then, based on that catching up, I'm going to throw something else out to you. One of the, something that's always bothered me about this catching up principle. Then let's say it's say that it's consistent in this show, and I'm going to use for my example, timeless, whereby the bad guy goes back in time, something is changed, and yet the main characters still have time to get in their time machine and go back and stop it. You know, they're, they're, they're talking about, we have to get to him before he does this. And you're thinking, he's already done it, mate. This was 60 years ago, you know. So that they've, they've allowed that. They've just had that. That's the conceit of the show. The two time periods are somehow running concurrently now, and they've got an hour before they do it, so so have we got an hour before they do it. Putting that aside... Come down to what happens after the fact when they have changed time in timeless when the car- the heroes return to the present, all of their present has changed around them, and one of the things that really bothers me because uh, i can 't quite work out in my head what 's occurred is the main email character, and I wish I could name them i 'm going to have to do this Lucy. i can 't google it sorry L- Lucy. Lucy, thank you. You're going to do all my Googling for me or just have a better memory. (laughs) Lucy comes back to the present and all of a sudden she's got a fiancé. And the fiancé says, "Uh, you're acting a bit weird, dear. We've we've been going out for two years and we've had all these romantic experiences. And I've got proof of that. Here are the photos. They definitely occurred. The physics of the universe proves that you were in love with me. Now, of course, the Lucy that comes back has no memory of this because the time's changed. I am desperate to know what happened to old Lucy. Who went back in time? And it's bothered me to the extent that I need to know if there is a new timeline and Lucy is now in the new timeline, or whether she's just returned to the same timeline, old Lucy has been wiped from existence. Because that means every time I watch the show, every single episode they kill Lucy. And that's just horrible. <laughs> Have anybody been stuck on any of these things where you think, hang on a minute, once I start thinking about this, it's awful, or my brain hurts? Marty McFly has the same problem. Presumably there's a Marty McFly native to the timeline that he comes back to uh, because he watches him drive off. You know, he watches him travel through time. So what happens to that Marty? You know, does he disappear? Is he wandering around watching himself, trying to watch, you know, interact with the events or whatever? Um it's never explained uh, because you know back to the future is a romp and it'll do some funny stuff with time travel but it only goes so far Uh, in timeless it's interesting the whole um because when i watched it recently the the whole aspect of um the the bad guy is back in time and they know that he's back in time and they need to stop him it actually has something to do with the main computer on the time ships is about when it resyncs with the um, the main computer at the the facility that they leave from, because that's how they know that they've time travelled in the first place. And you had this whole thing about them. Uh, there was that episode where they had to guide it back remotely because they broke their guidance computer or something like that. So Timeless did come up with a way of solving that in the sense of um, it's only once this. You know, it's only once both ships make the return trip or something like that that it the timeline catches up. So I wonder if, um, you know, I, I wonder if the, the the Lucy disappearing issue, yeah, because 
both timelines would have had them travel back in time, I suppose. Um, so and it does raise that? the thing of what if the timeline has changed to the extent, you know, right, it changed to the extent that she had a boyfriend, but what if it changed to the extent where they never joined the, you know, the organisation for travelling? So, yeah. Timeless might just be one timeline, right? There's no alternate universes here. You know, you're always changing this timeline one. There isn't any others. And as it, my suggestion is the time machine shields their memories from being, shields them from being overwritten by the t- changes in the timeline. So it is the same Lucy that travelled back in time, but the whatever change needed to happen to alter her memories or alter her physical state doesn't doesn't kick in because of the time machine. So this proves your earlier point that you do like to have a bit of theory and a bit of chat and have a bit yeah. of discussion, and that makes it all the more enjoyable because of it. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately for poor Lucy, then, we don't need to resolve whether she is or is not slain multiple times as to whether we enjoy the show or not. So, yeah. I don't uh, think she is. I think uh, I think she just she's immune to the effects of the changing timeline, which is, you know, causing her to not know what what she had for breakfast before she left. Or, you know, or more seriously, the fact that she has a fiancé or that her sister never existed. Well, I'm actually happy with that because, yeah, it stops it being something quite so horrific. <laughs> and I think that's something that most of the time travel shows at some point have to challenge what are the consequences of our actions. It's It's almost a freebie that you can't miss. So even if you're not going to do a moral episode, you're certainly you're certainly questioning you know, the consequences of your actions. Um, I yeah. think that means that in the three topics we've discussed, we're not really too bothered what a time travel show does in terms of its basic setup, as long as it does it well. Yeah, yes. Is that <laughs> is that a good is that a good conclusion to come to? As long as you're a good show, you're a good show. Yeah, well, the, the number one thing, reason you'll keep going back to a TV show is that you're enjoying it. So if you're enjoying it, they must be doing things that you enjoy. So it doesn't, yeah, it, it doesn't matter how they do it, how they make you enjoy it, as long as you enjoy it kind of thing. You know, there's something about it that will resonate with you, and that's that's all it needs to do. Right, I let's think it's a case of make it good, stick to your guns, and it'll work, you know? Yeah. Let's uh, let's use that as a jumping point to the final topic then, which is about, enough of this debate, what did we actually really like? What's actually the cool stuff? So, Chris, you got to pick one time travel show that you can watch with your three kids and you're not allowed <laughs> to watch anymore, because if you do, one of them will change the channel back. <laughs> Which show is it and why? Ah, oh, God, that's tough. Um, one time travel show. Um, with my kids, uh, it would need to be Doctor Who then, I suppose. Um, yeah, fair enough. Because it is, it is a, a, a fun mix of getting to go anywhere at any, t- any possible time. It can pop up anywhere. And it seems to follow the majority of its rules most of the time in an acceptable way. It doesn't change too much about timelines to an extent. When it does it has a bit of fun and does it with a cheeky smile and a wink to the camera normally. So, yeah, Doctor Who. Right. Now, you're falling asleep on the sofa (laughs) and your kids start changing the channels. And for the most part, you accept this because you think, I'm not going to got three kids, so I'm just going to fall asleep. (laughs) But one show comes on that wakes you up because you cannot bear for this time travel show to be on the telly and disrupt your family life. Which show is this that you just cannot let your kids watch? Uh, Oh, God, that's a tough one. And I'm trying to think now. Or even an episode of a show because it was just so bad. Um, I I think I've gone on the record enough to say the last season of The Flash can go away and die in a corner somewhere, maybe. Um, Yeah, (laughs) let's go go with that. I'll I'll stick to my guns from previous podcasts. (laughs) I'll just delete the last season of The Flash. (laughs) (laughs) Spoiler for anyone that hasn't listened to our... Well, I don't think it's been out yet, actually, our Flashcast. Yeah, 
<laughs> well, it's been by the time this is released. Oh, oh sorry. Travel. Yeah, yeah there's a time travel episode, so I, I, I may not, I may or may not have time travelled from that podcast yet. <laughs> but yeah, uh, spoiler alert: I want to delete it from existence. If you've if you've not heard that yet, we've spoiled quite a lot of things today. I think we're going to have to put a massive klaxon over the beginning of this uh, podcast. Uh, we'll need to go back in time and go to the intro and uh, warn everyone of what we're about to spoil. But um, but yeah, the last season of Flash it really really did me in. And then I'm going to go back to work. Uh, what I'll do is I will wake up. Flash will be on. I will tell the kids off. I will switch the channel over to Doctor Who, and then I'll go into my garage and I will construct the time machine to go back in time and to change the fact that I have somehow ended up with three kids. Um, <laughs> I think that's what I'll do. <laughs> That's a brutal reaction. Fair <laughs> enough. That's, that's yours to me. I would be the, the worst parent bad. ever. I am doing. I am doing them uh, more good than harm. <laughs> um, right to to move Chris past his trauma that he's clearly <laughs> suffering. I got to go on to Craig and say, shows or themes. What is it you've really enjoyed seeing about the time travel shows in the last couple of years? Well, I'm going to go weirdly obscure and go outside the past couple of years. Um, one of my favourite uses of time travel on television was in the Disney animated show Gargoyles. Right. I don't know if any of you guys will remember this, but every time they did time travel, the rules were precisely the same. So every time they went back in time, it was to create the event that they were... It was to create the... the or it was to help create the timeline that they did. So what you had was a... Um, the the character played by Jonathan Frakes, voiced by Jonathan Frakes, um, is rich because he was in the past and sent himself a, well, a valuable coin that he could cash in and become wealthy with, uh, stuff like that. So yeah, it's um, they were brilliant with time travel. Uh, every time it happened, it was, and you know, it wasn't well known how the event came to pass or how the timeline came to pass before they did the time travel. But the way that they would present it on a story level would be like, oh wow, that's pretty cool. Every time they did it, yeah. Can I persuade you to pick something other than The Flash for your reviled time travel usage in a TV show? True Calling. True Calling, okay. I don't even know this one. Please, uh, please it's, explain. It's the one that uh, Elijah Dushku, I think that's how you pronounce her name, Faith from Buffy, was in uh, years ago. I can't remember. I think it only lasted one season. But the the premise was, I think it was like bodies that came into the morgue would say, help me, and then she would be chucked back to the start of the day, and she'd have to figure out the, how they died or something. It was nonsense. It was rubbish. What what, what, what was nonsense about it, just to finish that? Um, it wasn't particularly in how the time travel aspect was happened. That was more just a plot mechanic thing, but it was just crap. Oh, um, right. Yeah. So like, the, the thing is, I mean, I suppose it, it didn't inspire me enough to think about the rules of its... It's premise. I was just sitting there being like, why am I watching this? It comes down to, this, as we discussed then, yeah, if it's good, it's good. If it's not, yeah. then you're just going to rip it apart. And it just immediately leapt into mind. So from years <laughs> ago of me watching this show, it's stuck with me as being something that I can't stand. Almost scarred as much as the thought of having three kids then, blimey. That That's it. Yeah. 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 When the corpse of a murdered woman seems to awaken and ask her for help, True discovers that she has the incredible power to relive that day in order to prevent that death. Over the course of the series, True struggles to keep her secret, juggle her responsibilities with her complicated personal life, and learn to control her power. Yeah, when you put it like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was 26 episodes, two seasons, so there we go. Rubbish. I'm going to pick my own, I think. I'm going to pick... Um, I'm actually going to pick Travellers for one that I'm currently really enjoying, despite what I've previously said on the site about Continuum and what I've said here about Timeless, which tried to give the impression that I do enjoy them. With Travellers, the one thing that I'm most interested in is the fact that I don't think they have quite yet revealed whether they're going down the Terminator closed loop or the Back to the Future paradox. And that is the problem for the characters at the time. They desperately want to believe that they've got a Back to the Future situation where they can change the past and they are prepared to die for that. They don't mind if they get wiped out through history because they've got this belief that it'll be worth it. But the horrible feeling in the background that weighs down on their shoulders as episode goes on and on and on is that they might be stuck in a Terminator universe where they cannot change the future and they have to face off their own 
mor- uh, morale problems because of that threat. I, I kind of hope they never resolve it, and it's always a audience to decide. But but we'll see. Um, as for my which one do I absolutely hate? Uh, I kind of don't, I'm not allowed to say the Flash either, so I'm not going to say that. No, no, no duplicates. No. no duplicates. So I have to come up with one really quickly. I'm going to. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to say Legends of Tomorrow, and I know it's a personal reason, um, but I can't. I I can't get past series two, episode one, where the plot threw everything else out the window because it was funny to do so. And it's the, it's the problem I have throughout a few TV shows that are not limited to time travel, but in that theme of if the show's good, it's good. If it's bad, it's bad. I, I just don't like it when compromise is made to the rules of the background because it's funny. Unless you're watching Roger Rabbit, in which case it's hilarious, because that's the whole point. But if it's like in S.H.I.E.L.D. where May will always tell Sky during a training program to be serious, take things properly, always obey your skill. And then at one point, when a bad guy is chasing down a corridor, she shoots over her shoulder in a way she couldn't possibly see and takes a risk with her life, contravening her her lessons to Sky because it's funny if she does it. And I think Legends has done that a few times. And I guess I just don't like fun. I guess that's the only absolute, that's the only, that's the only reason I could come to, to explain it. I just hate fun things, you know. I need the misery. What, what else can I do? So, so Chris has the misery. Craig is trying to avoid the misery and I'm seeking it out. That's what we've really learned about ourselves in this time travel episode. Wow. I never expected that it would be so life affirming. <laughs> or the opposite of that. <laughs> or the opposite. Yeah. yeah, you got it good. We we got screwed. So. I'm a pessimist who wants to be a, a, a who wants to be positive. Fair enough. <laughs> so, has I missed anything out about time travel for you, Chris? That you want to sneak in here before we leave it? No, no. I think we've covered it pretty much for TV, definitely. That's good. Well, you've got to make your time travel machine anyway. So if you finish, re- once you've finished getting Flash destroyed, you could just quickly nip in and change the show as you need to anyway. Yeah, so I just can't, I can't buy any of the parts for my time travel machine because the free kids are using up all my money. <laughs> Disappointing. Again, it's so bad for you. He's got it so bad. Um, Greg, anything you could throw positively into this mix with your abandoned pessimism and wanted optimism about time travel that we've missed? Uh, nothing that we've missed. No, it's just been interesting thinking about it in 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 a kind of discussive way uh, because it's not something that happens all that often. Um, you know, I get so used to nerd rage on the internet about these things, and sometimes it can be good just to sit and have a chat with them, like that whole it, chat about it, not with them. I don't want to talk to them. Uh, so the the conversation that we um, we had about how the timeless universe works, you know, that's it's cool. It was you know it's a something that um, should be more of. Um, although I'd be interested, because you talked about Dark Matter recently, how they did time travel, I'd be interested in your thoughts on their first foray into standalone time travel. Well, isn't that it's, a sensitive issue? It's top- um, topical and relevant, I would say. I don't know. I'm it's just, topical and relevant, so you're going to make me say it, right? Okay. I'm, I'm not um, a host, so I'm just creating, causing ripples and creating problems for other people. Oh, that's what you promised at the start, <laughs> to make my life miserable. Yeah, you did. So um, let's let's try and let's try and put my head into some semblance of order to say they suffered, I think, with the same problem that we've discussed in this episode. In that, I think they set up a rule at the in halfway through the show that then they immediately challenged with the end reveal. Because they, the, the, the crew of the Rise go back in time. And they go back in time to modern day in a modern city. And it's exactly what Chris said before. Why did they go back to exactly right now, exactly right Canada? Well, because it's cheap to do so, you know. <laughs> Guess what? 
do you tell the actors to come in in their normal clothes? Brilliant. So you, you've got that done. But put that aside. Let's say it's supposed to be fun, and let's let's let's, let's have the fun ensues from there time period, there is a point where one of the characters, Five, realises that an alarm was triggered on their ship because of some action she was going to take or had already taken depending on your perspective. So immediately you set up this idea of closed causal loops. You've gone back in time. You can't change anything. You couldn't stop yourself of triggering that alarm on the ship because you already did it. And the mystery, mystery of who it was turns out to be you, and there's nothing you can do by learning that it was you that took the action that you can then take on and, and undo that. So we've got Terminator, closed causal loops, it's self-determined, and it is what it is. By that, when you then get to the end of the episode, they then point out that history was changed in some small way because of their actions on the planet. And you're thinking, well, hang on a minute. Are you actually using both sets of rules here? Closed loops where you can't change anything and you've created a paradox without considering that you've possibly created a new universe? Oh, and who's being deleted? Nobody. And it's not even come up. It was was a weak treatment because they didn't do enough and it might work out. But I, I know the way the show goes. The show's rule is, if it's fun, it doesn't matter. And I think that's possibly a personal problem I have with it then, because I want it to matter. I don't want... I, I hate fun, obviously. I've said that. You know, I don't <laughs> want it just to be fun. I want it to mean something. I want, I want there to be consequences. I want the fact that they change history to be important to somebody, not just a throwaway comment. If somebody does something, then then somebody has to be upset or happy or sad because of this, not just, hmm, oh, something happened. And do you know what made it even worse? At the very end, I'm sure the character five says, well, I guess it must all mean something because this has been created by some power to be a certain way and it gives us all hope that for the future. And you're thinking, no, it doesn't. It doesn't mean anything <laughs> like that. It just means that you're telling me it means something and I'm supposed to believe you. So I didn't get on with that well at all. But, but uh, yeah, Dark Matter Season 1, loved it. Dark Matter Season 3, oh, yes, let's not talk about that anymore. <laughs> Enough pain has been caused me moving on. Hmm. on so. you're On the subject of making it fun and meaningful, uh, Futurama always did a good job with its time travel. The fact that Fry was his own grandfather... And uh, that became important because, you know, of solving a problem later on. Because he didn't have a... He was all inbred and didn't have a specific brain pattern. So the the giant brains couldn't control him like they could other people. Yeah, I think they get to use the Roger Rabbit principle freely, though. If you create something that's blatantly a comedy, then you're allowed to break the rules because it's funny. Because that's what you've set up at the start. So amusingly, by breaking the rules, they're consistent with the rules that they've created where breaking the rules is one of the rules. I actually think Futurama stuck to its rules. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd have to sit and watch it again and think about it more, but it it does seem like it stuck to its rules throughout. If it didn't, though, I think that'd be fine. I don't think you'd question it. I mean, you did get to the point where I think absolutely everyone had been in that room with Fry when he fell into the freezer. (laughs) Um, The amount of times they went back to that one moment, it was like a whole queue of people going in and out of that building (laughs) at that particular time. I think even he himself was there at one point. Yeah. Um, So, you know, I don't know how they weren't all tripping over each other. Yeah, I think it's going to be the same in Barry's household home by the time you get to season five (laughs) of Flash, you know, childhood home even, just, uh, you know. How many people people were there, yeah. It's like his mother puts on sandwiches for all the reverse flashes that show up. There was one example I never got the chance to chat about, though. The, uh, the Deep Space Nine episode, Children of Time, if anybody remembers it. It's the one where they um, find themselves on this planet and it's some temporal field thing. And, and basically what happened was the, the defiant crash lands and they, they build a society from there and them leaving it destroys that society and i mean it's not specific in its kind of rules thing but the the emotional impact of the fact that they end up erasing it you know by leaving that was um that was quite it was quite well handled i thought 
consequence. Yeah, yeah, something happened and it was meaningful, and somebody was upset, or or their life was improved because of it. Yeah, yeah. That's, I don't remember it, but based yeah. on that one little paragraph of description, I would already put it higher than several other episodes yeah. I've seen. Although Star Trek was never consistent with its time travel rules from episode or to episode or series to series, it always changed. Potentially, it's one of those series though where it's agreed that it's all one-offs yeah and you would be asking too much of it it's already set up that it's not trying to be completely consistent throughout four lots of seven series and like well who knows how many there actually were you could tell me but i don't know but they'd already said you know let's not get hung up on this about this each episode analyzes a topic and then we just move on and we agree to do that yeah Unless it's Enterprise, where the Temporal Cold War was supposed to be consistent throughout, and it just wasn't. Oh, yeah, we could have brought that up as <laughs> things that were pointless. Yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. I don't have much more to say about it other than it was pointless. That's another example of the writers didn't care, so why should we? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I think we have then come to the end of all of our examples and chat. So, The end or the beginning? Well, we'll ask Chris on that. He's on the time machine. So thank you for joining us, Chris. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Craig. You know, they say time is the fire in which we burn. That's either really meaningful or I not at all. I, I, think I, just, I thought I'd just quote Dr. Soren from, from Star Trek Generations with okay. all his time chat. I, I meant to do it earlier, but I forgot, so I'm doing it now. They remind me to go back in time and smack you in the face for being profound <laughs> at the end of the podcast. Well, you can you can do it in the future if you want. I mean, no, but I can't, I can't be in that room with you, so I've got to come along and do it. Like, I'll, I'll work out. Uh, there's someone at the door. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Don't answer it. <laughs> he did it. He did it. <laughs> brilliant, yeah. brilliant acting there. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you for listening to our musings on Time Travel TV. Also, thanks for the music used in this podcast. Go to nstems1117 for his Back to the Future theme on guitar and to Alison Page for her cover of If I Could Turn Back Time, both of which you'll find links to in the show notes. As ever, if you liked what you heard, please subscribe to us on iTunes, YouTube or any major podcasting app and join us for the next Kneel Before Pod. <laughs>